praise you, we praise you. How many know we serve a mighty God? Mighty to save, mighty to heal, mighty to deliver. What do you need today? He's got it. Turn to somebody and say, he's got it. He's got it. Whatever it is that you need today. And he can do what he's always done. He is more than enough. Who woke you up this morning? Wasn't your alarm clock. It wasn't my alarm clock because I forgot to set it <laughs> last night. So he woke me up this morning. I'm so glad that he did. Ten minutes early, too. So I was like, oh, thank you, Lord. Who put oxygen in your lungs? You didn't do it. You can't make that. Who drove you here in a warm car, I hope? Who provided the clothes that you have? You really didn't do that, did you? He provides. Morning by morning, new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Can I get a witness today that the Lord's been good to you? He's been good to you. Some of us, he, he's so good to us. How many of you ate extra good during the holidays? Some too good, right? During the holidays, huh? Americans, we love to eat, don't we? I was at a wedding last evening. There was food. There's always food, isn't there? Funerals, birthdays, holidays. We celebrate Tuesdays or whatever, right? Just any, any chance we can get to celebrate with food, but... I was thinking about it as we get ready to talk about this today, that it's, it's not the food, really. It's what happens with the food. Have you ever thought about that? The laughter, the tears, and everything that happens, but, but we love it. I like what uh, comedian Jim Gaffigan said. He said, we eat to have a good time. Really, that's all vacation is. Just us eating in a place we've never been. I mean, that's a good vacation, right? If, if there's food involved. I was thinking about the laughter, the tears, the fellowship, the friendship, the joy, the, the burdens lifted, the burdens unleashed, just even around our... We've got an Amish table. Anybody have Amish furniture? It's going to outlive me by about 200 years at least, I think. Um, we got this Amish table. We've had all kinds of times around that table. There's been laughter. There's been tears. There's been people we didn't know all that well when it came been people that we got to know better. It's been all kinds of times. Imagine your table, the experiences, the, the things that have happened around the table. You know, there, there's powerful things that can happen at a table I want to talk about today. One of the most powerful things that happened to me around the table was uh, at Terre Haute's finest steakhouse at the time. Come on, somebody. Uh, I got out a box and asked Rochelle to spend the rest of her life with me. And that table, actually her answer, <laughs> changed my life, right? But it was at a table. It's powerful things that can happen 
at a table. Leonard Sweet, bring that quote up for me, please. Leonard Sweet said, if we were to make the table the most sacred object of furniture in every home, in every church, in every community, our faith would quickly regain its power and our world would quickly become a better place. Wow. Powerful things can happen at a table. So I want to talk to you today in a moment. I'm going to pray first and ask God to just speak to us this morning and, and change our lives. Are you open to God doing that today? I mean, are you really open to God doing that today? And uh, so I'm, I'm going to pray for that to happen. And as we open our hearts to what the Spirit of God would speak to us this morning, I believe He can speak something very powerful, life-changing into our lives. I'm going to pray and then now I'm going to ask you to announce something to the person next to you, and then we'll take a seat. But let me pray. Father, in these next few moments, I know you want to speak into our hearts and lives. And so, God, I ask that we would be open, that we would be receptive to hear what the Spirit would say to us today. And God, may we do more than just be hearers. May we become doers of your word. And we ask your anointed power to be evident in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Turn to a few people and tell them there's power in the table. The, there's power in the table. Give them a high five, maybe, while you're at it. And then you can be seated. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but Christianity really got rolling more by the power of the table than the power of the pulpit. Did you know that? Like in the early beginnings of Christianity, uh, it wasn't so much the pulpit that changed the world, but as you read the scripture, it, it was the power of the table. It was people going house to house. It was people sharing fellowship together and intimacy and and as they did that then God came into the conversation and into the presence of the table and changed people's lives. And I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how Jesus and food kind of go together. How many are liking Jesus a little bit more now, right? <laughs> it's true. I was thinking about that. Let me, let me just share a few things that I thought about with Jesus. Jesus called himself bread. He said, I am the bread of life. I don't know if you know this or not, but he was born in Bethlehem, which was interpreted house of bread. So it's interesting that the bread was born in the house of bread. His first miracle that he performed was at a wedding feast, and he turned water into wine. The most famous miracle outside of the resurrection that I think Jesus did, because it's recorded, it's the only miracle outside the resurrection that's recorded in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is the feeding of 5,000. Over 5,000, actually. And then there was the Lord's Supper. I may have seen a picture, a painting, maybe. We used to do a play uh, over the Lord's Supper. 
And then my personal favorite is breakfast on the beach. And that's what Jesus served fresh out of the tomb in resurrected power. He appears to his disciples by cooking breakfast on the beach. Wow. That's awesome. And then, many of you know this verse in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. The Bible says, Behold, I stand. These are the words of Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with them and they with me. And so Jesus, is, it's amazing that he's on the outside of the door. Because when I think about Jesus and who he is, I think I need to be the one outside. God, would you please let me in? You know, is there some way you could allow me to come? But instead, the Bible says, and maybe this is you today, he's searching for you. He's knocking at your door. He's not, not sitting back just hoping you'll come. No, he's He's actively knocking. Maybe that's the reason why you're here today. Maybe that's the reason why you tuned in today is because he is knocking at your door, waiting for you to open up and, and to let him in. And, and as we think about that, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing that he wants to invite us to his table as well because also in the book of Revelation, it says there'll be another table where there'll be a supper. It's called the marriage supper of the Lamb in which we're going to celebrate that I made it. Right? Hello? How many are hoping to make it? One of these days, you know, if there's a trumpet sound or, you know, the voice of the archangel, whatever that's going to look like and everything, you're hoping I'm in that load, right? I'm, I'm going. And uh, there, there's going to be a supper there. And I was thinking about the power of the table and maybe just how Americans have lost the power of the table. I, I looked up some things. And, and here's, here's what I found, that we cook less than ever, but we love cooking shows. <laughs> we spend over $50 billion a year on dieting. $50 billion. As a matter of fact, American Christians spend more on dieting than on world missions. One in four of us eat at least one fast food meal each day. And we spend as much on fast food as we do on groceries. 60 years ago, talking about fast, 60 years ago, the average meal Meal time, dinner time, family dinner time was 90 minutes. Today, it's less than 12. And the average family has less than one meal together in five days. Often, that meal is in front of a TV or our phones, our devices. The average parent along with that, spends 38.5 minutes in meaningful conversation with their children per week. We have lost the power of the table. We've lost the power of the table. And I, I was thinking about this, too, in regard to the divisiveness in our culture. Has anybody picked up on that? Just a little bit. Um, you know, just the division in our, like, like tents, you know. Like, like it used to be, you know, like 
hey, I believe this way and that side believes that way. You should choose my side. But today it's more like this. I am on the right side and these guys are the devil and need to be destroyed. <laughs> and uh, I've I come across this fact a few times, so I think it's interesting, that they say that Democrats and Republicans in Washington, D.C. used to hang out more together. That like 50 years ago or so, uh, that they would be known for playing golf together on the weekends and going to breakfast together and different things. Matter of fact, Ronald Reagan, for one, uh, was known for, he would eat uh, with the Speaker of the House who was a Democrat at that time. And the two of them would hang out together and talk. But nowadays, what they say is most politicians in Washington, D.C. go to one of their houses over the weekend away from Washington, D.C., and so they don't hang out together. They don't get around the table together. They don't golf. And all they do is just think about how evil the other side is. I think it'd be great if Democrats and Republicans would start eating together again. How about you? I think that'd be a good idea if that would happen. But, but you know, that would mess with a lot of people, wouldn't it? <laughs> that, that would kind of irritate some folks. And it's funny because Jesus irritated a lot of people at the table, when you look at the life of Jesus, the biggest controversy of Jesus was often who he would eat with. As a matter of fact, Leonard Sweet, again, would say this in his writings. He said, Jesus was killed because of his table talk and his table manners, the stories he told and the people he ate with. Jesus did a ton of ministry at the table. You read it. And I want us to read one particular passage today. It's in Luke, Luke chapter 5. And again, Luke is this guy. He was a physician, an educated person in his day. And, and he went about trying to get the story of Jesus. He, he wanted to capture it in all of its details and facts. And so he says to us that he interviewed all these eyewitnesses and got all their takes on the things Jesus taught, the things Jesus did, and, and you know, what was his birth like? And so he asked Mary about that and, and all of these things. And so in Luke chapter 5, I'll set this up. It, it's the story of Jesus calling these men to follow him, uh, to be followers of his, that, to be disciples of his. And so he calls a few of them, and then after he calls a few of them, I want to pick it up in verse 27, Luke chapter 5. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi, sitting at his tax booth. Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi had the audacity to get up, left everything, and followed him. This was a shocker to everybody. Nobody's left out on this one. And, and just so you know, because when you read the Bible, and I know, I think about all, everybody here is reading the Bible, I hope. And um, reading, many of us are reading the New Testament through slowly this year and taking it in. And what you'll notice is one author might refer to somebody by one name more, and another author refers to them by another name. And, and so that shouldn't throw us off because all throughout the Bible, people had more than one name. And sometimes God would change people's names. 
Say, you, you've been called this, but I'm gonna call you this. And, and so with Matthew, Levi, it, it's the same person here. This is the same story that Matthew tells when he goes to write about this experience and about his experiences with Jesus. He, he's Matthew, the tax collector, but that's his Greek name. His Hebrew name is Levi. And he's in his booth collecting these taxes and Jesus calls him. And again, he had already called some of his disciples. I want to back up to verse eight and just show you this. He had called Simon Peter to be one of his disciples. And um, Peter was kind of one of these people who would speak first and think later. Anybody know anybody like that? Don't point to them, okay? So just, you might know somebody. And um, so Peter's kind of like that. And Jesus, you know, could do this thing of, hey, Peter, why don't you throw the net on the other side of the boat and see what happens? And, you know, here's this carpenter that everybody knows is a carpenter telling fishermen how to fish. But he says, you know, we'll, we'll do it anyway. And uh, so they would throw the net out. And this happened more than once where the nets would nearly break and the ship would nearly sink when they were trying to pull in all of the load of fish that happened. And when Jesus did that kind of stuff, Look at the impact that it had on Peter. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He says, I, sometimes I talk and I say too much. Sometimes, you know, I curse. Sometimes I say things, you know, sometimes I, I get mad. Sometimes I do stuff. I act out and different things. And I, I'm a sinful man. To which there would be a lot of people around him that would say, oh, hey, Peter, hey, you're a rough and tumble guy, you know? And your dad was kind of angry. So it's legit that you would be that way. And, and there'd be people that might come around Peter and kind of make excuses for him. You have people like that? Or, or maybe you're one of those people that you make excuses for other people's stuff. And, and Peter's like, no, I, I, I need to own my stuff because this guy's a holy man and I am an unholy man. I'm a sinful man. And most people, again, would say, okay, Peter, you know, we're all imperfect but when it comes to Levi, nobody's saying that. Everyone's like, yep, he's a scum. <laughs> he's dirt. He's no good. And, and it's because, if you don't know this and know your history, at this time, Rome had occupied this area. And, and they were so genius in what they would do because they wouldn't just use their own people, they'd hire the native people. And, and so they would hire Jewish people and say, hey, you wanna make some extra money? Sure, I'm up for that. And they said, what you, what you do, we need somebody that knows people. And what you're gonna do is you're gonna collect taxes for this whole area. And we wanna make sure nobody gets off the hook. We want to make sure everybody pays their dues. And so because you know people and you, you come from this area, you'll be, you'll be good at it. And, and you just sit at the booth and collect and you can get a little extra for yourself. And so the Jewish people said, traitor, how can you do that? How can you sell us out for this? And, and, and so there was this hostility toward these people. As a matter of fact, they even had a special category for them. There were sinners like Peter, and then there were tax collectors like Levi, who they're worse than sinners. And it's like Jesus 
totally ignores this. It's like it, it just goes over him. Like he, he doesn't even see it. And then Levi, of all things, he leaves everything to follow God. And I just want to say something right here. I, I think it's good to say this. You are not more of a sinner than Jesus is a Savior. See, you, you can't out the saving power of God. Could somebody get a little excited about that today? You, you can't do it. You can't out the Savior. But at the same time, I want you to know, if you're, if you're here and you need, you need God to save you, I want you to also know that, that Jesus is not a supplement to your life. He is your life. Okay, he, he's not like a vitamin to help you do life better and be better at life and whatever, although I believe that will happen. But he is here to radically invade your life with his life-giving power and totally revolutionize your life. He wants to do all of that. Well, let's read on. Verse 29. Then, okay, so, so Levi leaves all. And starts following, but then he held a great banquet for Jesus. He's so excited. I'm in. I'm in this group. Somebody's finally accepted me. And so he has this party at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors. Oh, my gosh. I mean, no, it's getting worse. <laughs> They're flocking in. And other sinners, no doubt. We're eating with them. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belong to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? You know, how, how, how can you do this? You know, we, we try to serve the poor and, and we, you know, try to walk through the crowd and, you know, bless people and, and some things like that but associate with them, eat with them. See, they, they really didn't have the problem with the party. It was the guest list that bothered them. It was who got invited. How can you be the Messiah and associate with people like this? But this is a defining moment in the ministry of Jesus. Because this is going to picture who Jesus came for. So maybe you need to write this down or say this after me. You need to create space at the table. Say it with me. Create space at the table. You, that's what Jesus would do. You know, the lonely. You know, we... I've said this before, you know, we live in a very lonely society. Somebody said to me today, they were on a ship with 4,000 people and they felt alone. It's possible. In many of the uh, countries with lots of money are hiring ministers of loneliness because of the loneliness of culture. And, and this is the thing that can fix it, right? How many know it's, it feels good when somebody says, hey, sit with us? Anybody remember the lunchroom? <laughs> right? How many, it didn't feel good when nobody invited you to their table and you're sitting there all by yourself. You feel like a loser, right? But when somebody says, hey, come over here and join us, you're like, hmm, that's right. There's power in it. And the first century table, oh man, this, this table, and Jesus told a story about this. He, he said, the table is where people kind of show who they are. And, and so he said, when you get invited to somebody's house for dinner, you shouldn't seek to sit at the head of the table. You should sit, anybody remember this? 
He, he said, you, you should go down to the other end because you're going to be embarrassed if you go to the head of the table and somebody's like, mm, uh, that's not your seat. Come with me. <laughs> and you're down here away from whoever was the big person at the table. And so he said, wouldn't it be better if you sat down there and then they said the reverse? Oh, no. No, you belong up here at the head of the table. And so it was at the table that you could tell who was who and, and who was the most important. And, and, you know, especially for Jewish people, I mean, they didn't want Romans and, and these sinners and, he, and, and these tax collectors for sure at their table because it wasn't just Jews against Rome. It was God's people against Rome because we're God's people. And that means they are not God's people. And that means Matthew is associating with people that aren't God's people. So he, he's this traitor. He's the enemy. He's part. And then Jesus is partying with the enemy. But Jesus takes the opportunity to flip it. And I love this about Jesus because he's always setting up the religious people to look bad and, and to flip it so that he can point out what it is. And, and he points out, and, and this is what he's going to illustrate here, is that separation doesn't equal purity. In other words, it's kind of like maybe you grew up this way in religion where it was salvation by subtraction. You know, I don't smoke, I don't chew, I don't go with girls who do. And so therefore, I'm, I'm good. You know, I don't drink this or I don't eat that or I don't go to those kind of movies or my skirt's this long or my hair or what. You remember those lists, anybody? Maybe you grew up that way. And it's like salvation by subtraction. You know, if I can cut this off of my life, then God will accept me. And I want you to know today, if you're in this house or you're watching online and you're not saved, that salvation is not by subtraction, it's by addition. When you add someone into your life, he brings everything that's necessary in order for you to be made ready for heaven. You don't bring anything except your sin and your shame and your reproach and you give it to him and he takes it from you. Isn't that good news? That, that's how salvation works. And, and Jesus explains it that way. And, and so you might be a Pharisee if you can't eat with sinners. You might be a Pharisee if you want other people to live like Jesus before they've had the opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus. And, and so we've got to make sure that we create space at the table. Look at the next verse. And, and I love this because he doesn't let the disciples answer. They kind of ask the disciples, remember? But Jesus hops in with the answer. And in verse 31, Jesus answered them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And Jesus is going to illustrate here as Dr. Jesus that healing can happen at the table. Say that with me. Healing can happen at the table. Not only at this table, but I want you to know at your table. At your table, healing can happen. You know, why do you go to the doctor? You ever thought about that? You know, uh, most of the time, it's either to see that everything's okay or it's not okay, and now it's hurting so bad, I've got to go to the doctor, right? 
And, and so, you know, you go to the doctor. And what, what, what would happen, though, if you made an appointment? I don't know how long it takes, maybe six months or something, to just make a general appointment. And uh, you make an appointment, and you go to the doctor, and the doctor says, okay, we'll do all these tests and whatever, you know, blood tests, whatever they do. And, and then now, tell me uh, what's going on. And you said, nothing really. Just came to hang out. <laughs> just, just wanted to be here, you know, kind of wanted to come see you again. You know, how many know you'd be getting a new doctor and you'd have a restraining order against you? And it'd be weird. And Jesus, it, it's like the Pharisees expected Jesus to be a doctor that doesn't want to hang around sick people. And unfortunately, that's where we find much of the church world today is here we are with the cure. Here we are with the answer. Here we are with God's presence in living in our lives and we don't get around those people. It's getting quiet today, isn't it? But how many know you can't point sinners to a savior if you don't connect with them first. And notice how Jesus, this is the son of God. This is how Jesus did it. And we talked about listening last week. I want you to know listening and eating are a great combo. You know, powerful things happen at the table. It, it doesn't only open up the stomach, it opens up the heart as well. And Jesus was known, listen, this is one of the tags that they gave him, is friend of sinners. And it came from eating with people like this. He's a friend of sinners. I wonder how many people call you that. Is that what you get accused of? See, probably if I had said when we first came in here, how many want to be like Jesus, about every hand would go up. I want to, oh yeah. Well, you got to be a friend of sinners to be like Jesus. You, you got to get around the table with sinners. He came for people, listen, who recognize their need for him. Maybe you're one of those people here today. The reason why you're here today is because you recognized your need of him and you thought, I, I, I'm going to go to church. I'm going to give this a try. I, I need God in my life and, and I'm going to go where I think maybe I, I could find him and where I can know about him. And so you're here today. But I'm, I'm telling you, that's what drew me to God. I recognized my need of a savior. I I cannot save myself. I can't be good enough. I can't be perfect enough. If, if, if that's what it takes to get into heaven, I'm not going to make it. But I've heard good news that it doesn't have to be me that gets me there. Jesus came that I might have life, that I might have it to the full. He came to redeem me. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. And I qualify. How about you? I need that. I need Need him in my life. And so Jesus came for somebody like me, somebody like you. And that's what we came for, is we came for those who know that they're not enough. You see, and here's the thing about Jesus. He doesn't condemn me. He was condemned for me. Isn't that good news? So, so we've got to be like that too because when you think about Jesus and how uncomfortable it got, I mean, think about how uncomfortable it was to leave heaven and to come here. I heard one Bible scholar one time say, he said, for Jesus to leave where he was and who he was and to come down here, it would be like you becoming a slug. And he said, even that's not quite descriptive enough of what it was like. And so Jesus, keep in mind, he allowed himself to come and to sit at our table. 
to invite people to come to his table. And he calls you, he calls me to do the same, to be willing to be uncomfortable. Look at this in Matthew, when Matthew talks about Jesus. Here's what he says. This is Levi talking in his writing. He says, the son of man came eating and drinking. And they say, here is a glutton and a drunkard a friend of those tax collectors and the sinners. But wisdom is proved right by her deeds. I say, may we be accused of the same stuff that Jesus was accused of. And here's the thing is, and I think this is one of the things that keeps us back, is it can get messy, right? I mean, let's just be honest. It can get messy to get up in people's stuff and to them to share stuff and and unload their stuff to us. But that's when powerful things can happen. I've told you the story a little bit and I'm sharing it in parts here during this series. Before we ever read this book about bless and how to bless our community and things like that, where we got some of the idea for this this whole series to talk about how we can do that. Uh, Rochelle was on a commuter bus when we lived up in Chicagoland, and and I've told you this before, you know, an hour plus on the way to Chicago... And an hour plus back home from Chicago, you get a little close sometimes with the people on the bus. And, and you become like a little family, so much so that maybe you're, you're down there at Madison and Wells or wherever downtown, and somebody says, hold up, hold up, she's running. <laughs> you know, she's not, she's not here yet, but she's on her way, she's running, she got her tennis shoes on and her skirt. And she's running, you know, and because uh, that was the look at the time in downtown Chicago. And uh, so they would do that. And this one gal in particular befriended Rochelle and they talk and, and then they wound up kind of sitting together and talking more and she would listen and whatever. And ultimately, this gal says, hey, um, would you mind grabbing dinner sometime? And uh, Rochelle says, sure, we, we can do that. And so they did. And it was at that dinner that she began to share about what was not going right in her marriage and about the struggle that was happening. And um, it was at that Table that then Rochelle was able to share a little bit with her about our situation that, you know, we're real different people and everything, but, you know, one thing that is in common is just God working in our lives and, you know, not sure where you stand with that, but, you know, that's, that's one thing that really has helped us. And so she was very open to that, and it began a conversation to a whole deeper level, stuff that you, you're not gonna talk about on the bus with everybody else. Stuff that, you know, you're not gonna share always out with everybody, but if we could get to a table, I'd like to tell you, and here, here's what you need to listen for when you do this, is you need to listen for the knots, Okay? You need to listen for the knots because some, some people, they're knotted up, right? But here's the knot. It's my marriage is not going well or I'm not coping very well these days. I'm not able to handle the stress I feel like that I'm under right now. And it's in those knots that we're able to share the only perhaps hope 
that is available through Jesus, right? It opens the door because he's able. He's the great physician. He's the healer. He's the one that can bring it into. And by the way, you know, they met at a, at a local place. And so the, this invitation doesn't have to be at your house because not only does the mess sometimes keep us from making the appointment, from setting the dinner up, um, but also my house is a mess. You know, my life's a mess. I, I couldn't invite somebody. You don't have to. You don't eat at home all the time anyway, most Americans. And it doesn't even have to be a meal. There's coffee places all over the place. But what I do know is, is to Jesus, meals were ministry. They were ministry opportunities. And so church, here's what I'm asking today, is let's not just eat with people we agree with. Let's not just eat with people that we want to eat with. Let, let's get uncomfortable. Let's make it our lifestyle, what Jesus' lifestyle was, that I'm gonna eat with people, I'm gonna get with people that are not like me in the hopes that they'll come to me. And, and so that's exactly what God's calling you and I to. So here's the last thing to maybe write down is set the table. Say that with me. Set the table. Set the table. Okay, so, so don't worry about the mess. Don't worry about how messy it might get the, and, and everything. Don't, don't worry about all those things. And, and especially don't worry about, well, I just don't have the time. Because here, here's the thing. Rochelle said, hey, <laughs> I'd like to, but I'm on this bus two plus hours a day. And my husband thinks we ought to have church three times a week. So while you're doing whatever you want to do on Sunday, I'm at church early in the morning. And then, that's not enough, we go back that evening. Other people don't always, but we do. We're always there. And we're there on Wednesdays as well. And so, you know, I, I just would love to, but... I don't have time to. And I wanted to pull up a graphic that maybe can illustrate something for us because out of seven days, the next seven days, the average American will eat 21 times. Some of you are overachievers, okay? So you, you'll get a few more things in, all right? But, but we won't talk about that today. That'll be another sermon, all right? But... Um, out of these 21 days, what I'm asking you to do is pray about one. Could you give one to somebody who maybe doesn't know Jesus? Could you do out of 21? Not, not all 21, not 20, not half. But out of 21, could you prayerfully consider who could I have coffee with? Who could I have lunch with? Who could I have breakfast with? One out of 20. Maybe you could get to where your life group starts asking, hey, who's your one of 21? What, what's your one of 21? And I know, again, that it can get messy. But it may be messy, but it's not complicated. What I'm asking you to do today is not complicated. It's clear. And yeah, it may get messy, but that's why Jesus' grace is available. That's why he came. So I want to encourage you. There's, there's a meal challenge card that you can pick up and maybe graph it if you need to or just use your own calendar and your phone. But when you come to the table, when, when you get to the restaurant early or, or when they're getting ready to come over to your house or whatever it looks like, would you maybe pray something like this? Your kingdom come to this table on earth as it is in heaven. 
God, would you let your kingdom come to this table? Because I, I need you. I, I need you to be here, and I want your power to be here. And also, I want you to know you are the one Jesus wants to use to bless someone else. You. You. But Craig, I don't know the Bible. Oh my gosh, I screw it up all the time. I think something's here and it's not, or I misquote, or I did this. I'm not a Bible scholar. I'm not whatever. I didn't ask you that. Could you do one of 21 with somebody? Because by the way, you're not the one to save them anyway. It's going to take Jesus to do that. You're not that impressive. You're not that important, really. Your story is what God will use. But to hear the story, you got to get together. And so when you get together, that's where powerful things can happen. And I, God will use imperfect you. And I, I want you to understand this today. And, and as your pastor, I want to make this very clear. You are our strategy for reaching this community. You. It's, it's not Facebook ads. It's not a powerful podcast. It, it's not our live stream. It's not, not our music. It's, it's not any of those things. Our strategy to reach this community is you. And you offering one of 21 to reach somebody else. You are the strategy to pray, to listen, and to eat. And here's the incredible thing, and then we're going to take communion in a moment. Is that Jesus invites us to the table. I mean... It blew those people away. Who could be invited? And it blows me away, I don't know about you, that he invites me to the table. I'm not over that yet. How about you? I don't think I'll ever get over it. That he would invite me to the table. And today... God's inviting you to invite somebody to your table. Let's pray. Father, help us today to prayerfully consider who our one is. That, that over the next week, there could be somebody that's a neighbor, that's a friend, that's a colleague, that's a, a coach, that's a a student there's somebody maybe it's a distant relative that we haven't connected with but all of a sudden they've moved back and they're in, the, in our lives again and maybe they're outside the realm of faith and it's our responsibility to get them to the table maybe you're here today and you'd say Craig I want to hear the voice of God. I don't want to miss God this week if there's somebody in my life or somebody that's going to come into my life where I could have an encounter with them that could lead to a life-altering impact of Jesus on their life, then I don't want to miss that. I want to be open to that. If that's you, church, would you just raise your hand today and say, yes, I offer my calendar, I offer everything. I, I, I'm sold out for Jesus. I'm, I want him to use me. Father, use every one of us. We are your strategy for reaching this community. It's not just a church strategy. It's your strategy for how you want to impact people around us. And in a divisive culture, help us to represent the United Kingdom of God 
that is able to bring people together, that's able to bring us to you. While we're still praying, there may be others of you that you're, you're not seated at the table, but I, I, I've got good news for you. There's a spot. There's an open seat. There's an invitation. And Jesus would want nothing more than for you to come to the table. It, with all your sin, with all your problems, your hang-ups, you, don't worry about all that stuff. He, he, he's going to help you with that stuff. But what he wants today is he wants you to come to the table. And if you're away from God, or maybe religion drove you away, I don't know what that looks like, but today, if, if you wanna get a seat at the table, not just this table today, but the table of eternity, and you wanna make sure of your relationship with God, would you just raise a hand right now and just say, yeah, I need in, I need in, yeah. Just raise it up all over this room, just raise it up. And as they're doing that online, just type the word decided in the chat, the word decided, and we're gonna be praying for you as well. As a matter of fact, I want everybody to pray this prayer, especially for those who raise their hand, but everyone prays so those around you will pray and say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to come into this world and to make a place for me. By dying on the cross, I believe you paid for all my sin so that I can have life and life to the full. So today I pull up to the table and invite you into my life. Come right now and forgive me of my sin and give me a new future. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's celebrate those who pulled up to the table today in an act of faith toward God. Listen, there are words that you can text as your next step. Next week's baptism around here, and so we'd love nothing more than to celebrate what happened on the inside of you, on, celebrate that on the outside by baptism. And if you'd like to do that, not only could you text that, but you can walk across the hall in just a couple moments if you're here in person and talk to somebody personally about that. All right, we're gonna take communion today. Isn't it awesome? that Jesus gave us a way to remember the table, to remember that he made a way for us to have a spot at the table. And he did it at a table. The scripture says, go ahead and take the bread in hand, that Jesus took bread. And when he had broke it and blessed it, he gave it to his disciples. And he said to them, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take and eat the bread together. And then you can open up the other end of the juice. Get it ready. Because then he took a cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant. Something new has happened and is happening. A new way has been made for you. A new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink it, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's take and drink the cup together. Now, I wonder if you could just stand to your feet and raise your hands and praise the God who has removed your sin as far as the east is from the west. So far has he removed your transgressions from you. You are washed. You are cleansed. You are redeemed. You are ready for heaven, not because of your merit, not because of what you've done, but because of what he has done. Can somebody just love him for a moment for that? Lord, we love you. We bless you. We praise you. We celebrate what you have achieved for us. We have a seat at your table because of you. 
I'm going to ask our prayer partners to come at this time and stand across the front. If you've got a prayer need at all, it doesn't make any difference what it is. If you just like somebody to pray with you or pray for you, that's what they want to do today. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. And then after that prayer, if you need prayer personally, just come on down and receive that prayer. Father, we thank you for the celebration of the table. We thank you that you made a way where there seemed to be no way in our lives. That one day when we were lost and undone, when we were hopeless without you, you came into our lives. And God, we rejoice with those who today did that. Holy Spirit, now draw every person who needs prayer down to this altar to receive the prayer that they need. And God, we thank you and praise you as you use us this week to make a difference in this community. In Jesus' name.